Thanks for coming. This is a very, very quick How to Fail at Kafka session. Um, obviously, it's a massive topic, so we're going to try and compress it all into 15 minutes. Um, so firstly, how many people are Kafka users already here? Okay. Uh, you don't need me then, I think. You've already solved all these problems, I guess. Or you're, at least you're aware of them. Um, so for you, those of you that don't know what Kafka is or have never used it, basically it's designed to solve this spaghetti architecture that enterprises often end up with, lots of disparate point-to-point -point connections. Kafka is designed to slice through that, decouple everything, uh, mean everything communic can communicate nicely between each other. But it's more than just messaging. It's got storage, ETL, and it's also got real-time processing, so stream processing, and a whole library of... Um, Connectors. There's a whole ecosystem of things you can connect to Kafka. So at its heart, it's very simple. It's just a log. Messages come in. They're written to the end of a log file. Um, dead easy. Other things can come along and read those messages from any point. Um, and out of that, you get a whole host of great features. Scalability, durability, resilience, massive throughput, low latency, all that good stuff. So what could possibly go wrong when you put Kafka into production? It's obviously something that a lot of companies are reliant on. Um, it's being used all over the place to solve all kinds of different problems. So I'm just going to run through the top five, I think I've got, things that uh, people don't think about when they're deploying Kafka or that they stumble onto or that they get wrong. And hopefully we've got time for all five, but if not, I will miss some out and you can come and see me afterwards. So number one, durability. So um, Kafka is designed to be um, clustered. So if you have one Kafka broker, you can have multiple partitions where your data comes in and it's stored in, in different partitions. Um, and if that broker goes down, your cluster's gone down. And you have no uh, Kafka cluster. So that's not what you want. Um, so with Kafka, it achieves durability through uh, replication. So Kafka clusters... Um, will copy the data to the other cluster members. So here, each of those gray blocks is a partition. The ones marked with an L are the leaders, so that's what your data gets written to. And then the data gets copied across to the other partitions in the cluster. Uh, this way, if one um, cluster goes down, one cluster member goes down, the leader is automatically moved to um, another node, and everything carries on working as you would want it to. So. In this setup, is your data safe? Well, it does depend on your configuration. So as your producers are writing data into Kafka, um, they get an acknowledgement. So uh, this producer has sent its message, gets an acknowledgement back um, as soon as it's written to the lead partition. So your producer then might think, great, brilliant, my data's in my Kafka cluster, I can go off and do something else. But your data has not yet been replicated to the other Kafka members. So there's a danger point here. If your producer thinks it's written the message, but that uh, node on the left goes down, you've actually lost your data. It hasn't been replicated. So there's a setting you need to be aware of, uh, which is Axe. So by default, Axe is one, which means it waits for, the producer waits for an acknowledgement from one uh, Kafka cluster member before moving on. But you probably want to set it to Axe equals all, and that means it will wait for the data to be replicated to the other cluster members um, before counting as an acknowledgement. So this way your data maintains its durability. Um, but there's a little hidden gotcha here, because if you say X equal to all, it won't necessarily wait for acknowledgements from all the cluster members. It relies on another little setting we've got, which is the number of in-sync replicas. <clears throat> so. If here your producer puts a message into one Kafka node, it has ax equals all. Um, it'll wait for acknowledgments for all, from all cluster members up to the count of the min in sync replicas, right? So let's make sure we're clear on this one. If I've set min in sync replicas to two, but I've only got one node in my cluster, that won't count as that data being written. So you need to make sure you set your uh, min in sync replicas appropriately. So for example, default is one, but if you set it to three, which is the recommended setting, 
when your producer writes the message, it makes sure that the data has been written to all three members of the node, members of the cluster before it counts as an, an acknowledgement. That means when a node goes down, you can be sure that your data is copied to the other cluster members. Um, so sort of a little note on the way Kafka is being designed. It's by default is optimized for availability and latency. If durability is more important, you need to change these parameters and you need to make sure that you've set them to the appropriate settings for your particular use case. <clears throat> so that's gotcha number one. Number two is assuming everything will always work. So in this case, you've got a producer and it sends a message into your Kafka cluster. Um, but if the node it's writing to is down, it will fail to get um, an acknowledgement. So the producer will think it hasn't written the message at all. And in this case here, that's because it tried to do it when the leader was being moved to another broker. So another setting you need to play with is retries. So the default retry value is actually zero, which means that your producers won't retry and send this message. It'll just say, oh, well, that didn't work. So you need to change that to be a much bigger number. Uh, so if, for example, you set it to two, in this case here, the producer will try and send its message. Uh, it will fail to get an, an acknowledgement, so it will try again. And this time it will hit the, uh, the leader on the right um, node, the one that's up. Uh, we actually say, why not just put it up to infinity? Then your producers will keep trying to send messages um, forever until it gets successfully written. That then actually exposes you to another problem, um, which is that of duplicate messages. So if we look here, the producer will write a message to Kafka, and if it then fails to get an acknowledgement, it'll try again. It'll send it again. And you end up with two messages, because actually the first time the message was successfully written, but it was the acknowledgement that failed. Um, so another setting you need to be aware of is idempotence. So uh, Kafka producers, you can just enable this idempotence. The default value, again, is false. So you need to change it to true. Uh, this means that each message gets a unique ID. So if a producer um, write, successfully writes the message but doesn't know that it has and tries again, um, the Kafka brokers will spot that it's the same message because of its user ID, its unique ID. Um, and it will just count it as one message, so you don't end up with duplicate messages. So tip number two is to use the built-in item potency. Um, I'm really skipping the, these at a high level. There's a whole uh, world you can uncover for idempotent consumers, exactly want semantics. Come and see us in the Confluent booth if you would like more details. Uh, number three is uh, you've got to be careful. You've got to be aware of your exception handling. So um, here I'm just going to talk about uh, exception handling on the producer side, but obviously things can go wrong in lots of different places. You need to keep an eye on thinking about where things might go wrong and how you might deal with those situations. Um, on the producer side, you've got a few options. So I just mentioned the sort of infinite retry idea. So that's just saying, keep trying to write my message until it gets written. Um, the other option is to flag that message as not being written, maybe have 10 retries, and then send it to um, some kind of dead letter queue or topic where you can keep track of all these messages that have failed to be written, and then another process can come along later and uh, deal with it. Option three is to just ignore that message, ignore that error, and carry on. And again, this will just depend on the kind of data that you've got and what you need to do with it. So unfortunately, with this one, there's no silver bullet, right? You just need to think about what your data is, what happens when it goes wrong, what happens if it goes wrong at each stage of the process or each component, um, and deal with it accordingly. I'm really rattling through these in a 15 minute, <laughs> so apologize for the speed. So number four is no, no data governance. This is a common mistake people have. So with Kafka, you can put any data you like into it. It's just bytes. So any message can be any collection of bytes. They all get moved around. Kafka doesn't care. A consumer can come along and it can consume those bytes. 
at that point, it probably will care what those bytes are going to be. So a common thing we see is people have a message, so that one going in there is a name and a date of birth. There's obviously a particular format here. Everything here you could say is version 1 and the version 1 of the schema there. Um, if you then change that schema, so basically now you've changed that date, it was a string and now it's a timestamp, uh, but there's a consumer that's been left behind here, it has not been upgraded to the latest, um, to understanding that latest schema. So it's going to fail. So you've got to be aware that changes to what your producers are doing will impact your consumers further down the line. So there's a solution to that, this, and that's to use the schema registry. And this gives you a central point where your producers and consumers can look up their data types. They can make sure they're all understanding the same messages. Um, and actually, Confluent Schema Registry is based on Avro and allows you to do um, non-breaking changes. So you can actually change the schema. You can have a producer producing messages to a new, con new schema, and your consumers are fine with that because they can look up the schema in the schema registry or ignore those messages if it doesn't understand them. So it's important to have some sort of central mechanism in place where your producers and consumers can be sure that they're all talking the same language, right? They're all sharing the, the same data. Um, <clears throat> number five is you've got to pay attention to your network bandwidth within your cluster. Now, this, is it, this one crops up quite a lot. So if you have um, a Kafka cluster here, this has got four nodes, um, and the topics are partitioned across the nodes like that. So there's a, um, the ones in orange are the leaders. So there's a leader for, for the topics on each node. If one node goes down, this is all fine because your data is all replicated. Something else takes over to be the leader, and you're now running on a three-node cluster. It all works fine. But probably you want to put that fourth node back up because uh, that's what you designed. That's what you had to start with. And as soon as you do that, these uh, topic partitions will start to be copied across, right? We want our data to be replicated across our nodes. So this data starts to be copied across. If these partitions are 50 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, there's a big impact there, right, on the network infrastructure in your cluster. And it's also going to take time. If, if these are massive partitions, it might be hours, might be days for all your data to be copied back onto this new Kafka broker that spins up. So you need to be aware of how big your partitions are. Um, you need to think about what happens when they move around. Maybe you need smaller partitions, but more of them. Maybe you need more Kafka nodes. Maybe you need uh, better network infrastructure in your cluster. You need to be aware of um, how things like this can happen. Um, so the last one I've got here is um, no monitoring. So. It's all very well having your Kafka cluster up and running, um, but you need to find out if it's working correctly, if everything's going according to plan. Um, so there's a collection of JMX metrics you can gather uh, from all the brokers, um, from the clients. Um, we have a nice web page that explains how to do all this. Um, and the kind of things you probably want to be able to answer are sort of application level things. So are my applications receiving all my data? Are, uh, is everything got the latest data? Which applications are running slowly? Is there any areas that we need to scale up? Um, can the data get lost anywhere? Will there be any interruptions? So as well as monitoring sort of system OS level things, CPU usage, memory usage, disk usage, um, it's important to keep an eye on um, some of the sort of application level things as well. Uh, we actually have our Confluent Control Center, which um, helps you monitor these kind of things, gives you a nice web-based uh, user interface. It'll show you if more messages are being produced than consumed. It'll show you end-to-end -end latency um, and various metrics about what your Kafka cluster is doing, whether the partitions are balanced, um, and all kinds of metrics and information about throughput and uh, bandwidth usage. Um, so that... I think is my time up, really. Rattled through it. Uh, a quick plug at the end for Kafka Summit, which is on Monday and Tuesday next week. There are some tickets available. Come and see us at the Confluence Stand if you'd like to attend. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be in San Francisco um, at the end of September, then pop along there as well.
Any questions in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> there will be a quiz afterwards. No, there won't. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>